Hi everybody, my name is Nick. Today I'm going to show off some low poly modeling techniques in Quill. So the first thing I'm going to show is basically just how to make different primitives. And the point of this presentation is really going to be helping you get your characters or your environments or your props to be a little bit lighter so that you can use them in uh, maybe a game, maybe a um, like a film. If, if you're making a film like Soda Island or like Namu, those films run for 15 minutes sometimes, and the characters or the environments, you can't paint everything super heavy or you're going to run out of space super fast and you never make it to the 15 minute mark. So this will help you keep your stuff a little bit lighter, a little bit more clean, so that you can better work on longer things. And like I said, it's also great for games. If you're making a game, especially if you want that game to run on in VR, you don't want you don't want the game character to be 200,000 uh, triangles or anything. You want to keep them pretty lean. So uh, the techniques I'm going to show here are also things I use to get the characters into VR chat, um, which was really fun. That the limits for VR chat for Quest are only 5,000 polygons, so trying to get a character down to that size is, is quite a challenge. And yeah, I'll show you how you can get a character from being really big to really small. And the first place we're going to start with that is just primitives. Uh, the best way to build certain primitives in Quill. So a sphere um, is one that for a long time, myself and most other people in the community would use the lathe technique to, uh, to make a sphere. So that would involve kind of making a circle, make a nicer circle, uh, good enough, a circle and then you kind of uh, duplicate, repeat it, and you get this nice uh, circle. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, a little bit nicer than this one, but you uh, you get the idea. And this you can you can shade it, and you know it's uh, it's pretty good, and it's it's flexible, and it's it's a nice uh, nice way to make a circle. But the problem is that it's kind of crazy heavy, and if you look at the geometry, it's super dense. So just as a, as a basic way to make a circle, um, you can do it just with a single stroke. So if you just take your line tool, hold the left trigger and click, you basically get a circle, um, although it's a little bit triangular. So the way that I kind of avoid that is I'll, I'll draw it, but I'll kind of draw it uh, along an axis so it's kind of got a nice pivot point. And then I'll actually pivot it a few times like this. Um, and then basically you get a slightly denser circle than it was before, but still a million times lighter than this one. And this still works pretty well for um, shading and, and such. You uh, Let me turn off the wireframe. Uh, a circle like this still looks pretty good. And... Um, yeah, it gets the job done in 90% of situations. If you need a circular decoration, or if there's a ball in the film, it still squashes and stretches pretty well. And yeah, I would advise circles like this in nine out of 10 situations. If you need super flexible stuff, this works, but in most cases, this will get you where you need to be. Um, another thing that's good about this lathe version is that you can do some weird stuff, like if you wanna make a shape like this, for instance, but you don't need this to do this. You could just take two of these, and then if you blend them together, you can basically get like a similar kind of shape. You don't need to always go super high poly. Um, a lot of time you can pull this off. Uh, next is a cylinder. It's basically the same can technique. Can I add to that really quick? Um, if you just do a short line stroke like um, what you did, like a sphere, right? Yeah. Like, if you don't see it from multiple angles, then you can just leave it like that and just choose the angle that looks smooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, another. this isn't really a sphere, but in some cases, if you have a sphere in the scene and it's far away, um, like in, in the golden record, we have these, these things on a conveyor belt. In the foreground, we have circles like this, but in the background, our circles are just a flat brush. Um, and if you look at them from a distance, it looks like a sphere. But then from the side, it's it's flat. But that's uh, it's not really a sphere. But it gets the job done when you're far away. 
nobody will really notice. Um, for cylinders, it's kind of the same technique, just you hold the left trigger, you draw a little cylinder, and that's kind of it. Uh, if you wanted to, you could do the same thing here, where you could kind of rotate it a few times. It makes it a bit sharp, but it generally looks nicer from the different angles, but it depends on what you're making. Uh, just this default one can oftentimes be good enough. Uh, next is a cone. It's the same as a cylinder, the only difference is while you're drawing it. If you use the, the left, sorry, the right analog stick and you push up and down to change the size, you can basically just pivot that into a cone. A uh, cube is very, very straightforward as the other ones are. It's just left click, click once, you got a primitive cube. Uh, sorry, just should mention, you want to be using the cube brush when you do that, then you'll get a cube. Uh, same with these. This you don't want to be using the sphere brush. This one you want to be using the cylinder brush. Uh, the cone cylinder brush as well, just with the taper. Um, and yeah, cube is just as you'd expect. It's the cube brush. Uh, you can also build the cube with flat brush strokes. This gives you a bit more control. Because the cube I have here, if I was to color it, um, it kind of is just reliant on the direction you painted it. So it kind of needs to gradiate from one side to the other. If you wanted to have a low poly cube that is a little bit more flexible, you can kind of create, you can take the ribbon brush, create one plane like this, uh, and then I would duplicate rotate this, kind of put it over here, kind of line it up, try to get as close as you can. Um, a little bit more there. And then I would do it again, I'd take them both, Duplicate rotate like this, and then one last time I take the last two faces and duplicate rotate like this, and then you get yourself a cube that you have a lot more control over because you can change each individual face, uh, which you know allows you to do nice lighting um, on something as simple as a cube. So a lot of props are built like this rather than just a single click cube, but it depends on the on the project. Uh, pyramid. Again, it's like the cube, typically put your cube down while you're drawing it and then just use the right analog stick to kind of taper it. So um, if you wanted to give this one some shading, one way that I normally do it is to just grab it, offset it a little bit like this, and then I'll like darken it. And it doesn't work for everything, but in most cases it's usually usually good enough to get you a, a nice a nice little pyramid. Um, the same way as we did the cube, you could kind of build out the planes one at a time. Um, like this, if you wanted to have more granular control and you could kind of construct a pyramid like that. But again, it depends what you need. In most cases, I build pyramids just with, with one or two brush strokes. Um, and other is kind of just shapes that you can get with the um, thickness tool. So let's say I had a, let me just, like this. With this shape, I can now use a thickness tool and I can kind of change it a lot. So when I first started using Quill, I really rarely used this tool. But nowadays, I like to use it a lot because you can get a lot of interesting shapes that otherwise are a bit tricky to sculpt in Quill. Um, so you can get like a bottle or a, like a vase. This could be a chef's hat. Uh, all sorts of stuff with just one stroke you can get a lot of shapes so you can experiment with the thickness tool for those sort of objects. Um, so now I'm just now that you know how these different primitives are built I can show you how I would build a quill character with these primitives. So this is a character that I made a few months ago. Um, it was designed by my girlfriend and I wanted to take this character into VRChat. But VRChat has a limit of 5,000 triangles, otherwise it doesn't work on the quest. So I set a goal to say, how can I get this dense character light like this? And sometimes you have a character much harder than this one to, to pull off with more, carrot, more hair, or he has a cape, or he's got uh, claws or whatnot, but um, I can show you the process for this character and these techniques Usually you don't have to go quite this low. 
Um, but I'll show you how you could take something that low if you needed to. So I'll break it down first, and then I'll, I'll try to recreate it again. So the original quill version I made, I had separated each of the limbs out. Like the arm, for instance. When I'm working in quill, I like to kind of separate the arms from each other like this, because it makes it easy to kind of animate when you're working in quill. Um, I also gave his body a lot of dense mesh, which is which is useful if you want to do a lot of squash and stretch animation, but usually it's not really necessary. Uh, the legs are the same as the arms, they're kind of just two pieces each, and they also have a, a little shadow here. And the head as well is made of these lathe strokes, and it's typically just lots of geometry because there's lots of different pieces. So to build this again, but lighter, I'm going to turn off the wireframe for now. I would first start with the, uh, the sphere brush. I would take the head and then I would just hold the left trigger and I would create like a, like a tube and then I would use the other brush to kind of taper it a little bit. So just a tiny bit of taper will give me basically the head shape I'm looking for here. And if you notice the top kind of sticks out a little bit, it's kind of a subtle thing, but I like to take the grab tool and sometimes I'll just kind of try to try to flatten that out just a little bit. From there, I would take the other yellow. Just I like to work with kind of a gradient on my mesh. It makes it easier for me to tell what's going on. You can also turn on the brush grid helper like this, and then you can kind of see. Uh, at this point, if I wasn't going to be working with kind of like I showed before, if I didn't want to go and duplicate it like this to create more mesh, uh, to keep because I'm trying to keep it as light as possible. I'm trying to get it to 5,000. I would actually just take this. I'd make sure it was rotated so that this flat side is facing me. Because if it's not symmetrical, it's going to be a little bit harder to work with. So I'm going to turn it either like this so this flat side is facing me, or I could turn it like this so I have two flat sides facing me. Either way, as long as it's symmetrical, it'll make it easier to uh, to work with going forward. So I might keep it like this, uh, just so you can see it clear. So I have an equal left and right side. Um, now I'm going to kind of start sculpting with this one shape. So I would bring the bottom up a bit more so it's kind of at the same level. I, I can again kind of flatten this. And then if I want to kind of get that, that kind of bounce or, or edge of the bottom, I can use the thicken tool to kind of expand it a bit. So just with one sphere, I was able to get pretty close to the original head shape. Uh, and from there I can start to add more details. So the eyes, I would do just with a rounded ribbon. I would probably just color pick it, and then I would just kind of draw a single line. And then again, I'll use a thicken tool to kind of round it from the center. I kind of, I'm going to compare pretty good so then I can put some eyes. I'll fine tune this later. I might actually take the whole head and use the thin tool on it because it's a little bit, um, a little bit wide. Then I'll just take, okay, we got this nose shadow. I can do maybe like this, maybe color pick the black. And then sometimes to get shapes, I'll actually just use a single stroke and I'll just use the color tool to kind of make it seem separate. In this case, I might still have to use another stroke because I want to get that rounded kind of dog nose top. So maybe like this, and then maybe I can use the thin tool on the bottom part and kind of get it nice and uh, nice and thin. So um, comparing it, the size is a bit off. I'll kind of scale it like this. I'll bring this down with the thicken tool, but that's pretty close. So if I'm to put that over here, can you rotate it to the side a little quick to yeah. see the profile? Yeah, so it's in flat. this case, yeah, it's flattened. Um, if you want to check out this other version I made, I made the nose a bit more complicated here. I used kind of a triangle, a flat piece. Um, you could give this more thickness if you wanted to use something like the capped ellipse brush here, because this one has a bit of depth. Um, again, it really depends on what you're doing. This is me trying to get it as low poly as I can without losing too much of the original design. Um, if you 
weren't going for requests or you weren't going to 5k if your goal was 10k you know maybe you could you could afford to use a few more um like 3d brushes for instance <clears throat> but it depends on your on your target really so the eyebrows i'm just going to do you can draw them i usually turn off the the press whenever i'm drawing things and i kind of just use the thick and thick to to adjust at the end but you can either draw the eyebrows or you can draw one out as kind of a line and then using your grab tool you could um, kind of just shape it. And then I'll usually take an eyebrow and I'll, I'll duplicate it and I'll flip it and that will usually get me the other eyebrow. Alternatively you can do a whole left side first and then you can just flip the entire thing afterwards and then you have a nice symmetrical model. Uh, for the ears I'll do the same thing. I'm just going to use this, uh, this kind of sort semi-thick brush. I'll use those like this, and then I'll offset it a bit, pick the orange, so then we have two kind of colors. I'll duplicate that too, and his head is still looking a little bit thick, so I'm just going to thin it again. Put these eyes are floating a little bit. And then once again, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to kind of flatten the top of the head a bit just to kind of get that shape. And it's starting to come along. So at this point, I want to do kind of the beard. So it's not going to be with the same kind of thick brush as it was before. I'm just going to do a very simple um, kind of shape like this. And if I'm painting, if I'm kind of color picking from a model or a picture, uh, sometimes I'll actually paint with a different color just so I can see the strokes clear because if I'm using yellow, uh, it can be a little bit hard to see, especially probably on the on the stream. So sometimes I'll use like a red or something and I'll then kind of go and I'll maybe build the beard uh, or I'll build the shape with a different color brush so that I can see it. And then at the end, I would uh, I would kind of change the color back. So we get those red. Oh, oops, I guess I'm on the same layer. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I would generally work like this. I would take the pieces like that and then maybe I would throw it back over here, recolor it. Uh, and like I said before, I really like gradients, so I might give it a subtle gradient just so I can see it and then I can fine tune it again over, over here. And then if I wanted to capture back these lines, like you can see I did in this one, I'll take some of that color and I will uh, I'll just kind of draw some lines. So in general when you're working on something one of the most important things for keeping it light is to choose to use the flat brush instead of the um, kind of the the 3D brushes. So this brush here the round ribbon brush which is completely flat and the regular ribbon brush these are both completely flat and in a lot of cases, you can substitute kind of the capped ribbon brush for one of these. Um, so the capped ribbon brush is like this. You can see it has a bit of depth. And the, um, where is it? The ellipse brush too, kind of is the same. If you actually look at it under a microscope, this one is basically two, at least two times, no, it's, if you look at this brush, it's basically one plane. Whereas this capped brush is actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine planes. So this brush is about nine times heavier than this brush. Sorry? Um, this brush here is about nine times heavier than this brush. Same here. This is probably about nine times bigger than this brush. So if you only use flat brushes wherever you can, your character will be so much lighter than if you build it out of kind of these thicker strokes. And most of the time, uh, if you're detailing, for instance, nobody will even notice the difference. Um, so for this one, I actually did actually also like um, yeah, I like to add it's actually a significant difference, especially if you animate frame by frame. Yeah. Um, if you use the ribbon brush um, down the line, like you can save a lot of space, like exponential actually. The change yeah. Because um, imagine nice. imagine you have um, a film like Soda Island. And you have an ant character that gets 
used for maybe he has animation that lasts six minutes total if you have 12 frames a second uh or 24 frames a second and you have a frame a, an image every frame uh if your character is 120,000 triangles for every kind of frame that's gonna you're gonna run out of space really fast but if you have a 5,000 character 5,000 size character you're gonna you have way more limit before you start to to run out of space so if you're aiming to make a really long film um having your character built lightly can really take you so much further. So here I can see I built this mouth out of a 3D stroke. Here I'm just going to redo it with kind of uh, just a stroke like that. I'm going to move it over. And you can kind of see... That is also a good calculation. If you're planning to do a short film, you can just, um, just save your character, look at the memory usage, and then multiply it by the frames. But the approximate amount of frames you want to animate and then you can see if at least if your character will be within the memory limits um and if you want to do like a complex film like soda and sometimes you have to do those calculations to guesstimate like if if it's even feasible mm -hmm. yeah because if you start a film blind you could very easily run out of space uh halfway through the project and then you're stuck you'd have to reanimate or you'd have to rebuild your character and then reanimate it's it can be a huge pain. So for the hair, I'm just doing the same thing, just a few flat strokes, and then I want to kind of make sure it sticks out. So you can either draw like this, or sometimes if I'm lazy and I want to do lines, I'll actually just duplicate the mesh, kind of put it underneath, um, and then I will kind of offset it to kind of get lines like this. And those end up being perfect lines. They don't really work from upside down, but in this case, it might actually be uh, a nice solution anyway. So you can see he's starting to come along. Uh, I'm not going to probably do the whole character here. I'll move on to something else, but I'll show how I would do a few other pieces. So the body, I would just do like a like a like a rounded one like this, and that would basically be my body. So if you notice, I changed the design a little bit here, and the reason is because one way I like to kind of hide seams and low poly models is to colorize the mesh itself to um, like like this because then if I have an arm sticking out of it that's also orange it, it blends in it it looks a lot better than if it was kind of going into a a white model because then suddenly you get these really ugly mesh intersections which especially if the character is going to be rigged or you want to animate it you're really going to notice those those intersections so wherever possible I like to kind of keep the the color of a limb the same as the color it's going into just to kind of ease those intersections out um, so yeah i kind of painted it like this you get these subtle you get kind of a gradient between these two colors so orange and white there's going to be a little gradient sometimes you can kind of just grab the uh maybe i won't be able to pull it off on this scale but sometimes you can use the grab tool and if you can get it right, you can kind of do this and you can get it to be a little bit more fine. But as you saw, it kind of messed up over there. Typically, I, I don't need to do that, but um, but there is a way to kind of ease those out. You can also, uh, if you hold the left trigger while you're using the color tool and you kind of push forward, you get that same thing you get with the grab tool where you have influence. By painting with that, um, I, maybe you can't see it here because the model is so simple, but Generally, it gives you a much harder edge compared to if you turn it off where you get more of like a feathered edge. So that's a way you can kind of color. Just hold left and push forward to get the hard edge colorize. Um, when it comes to the neckline, I can show you how I did that. That was just a, um, it was just a tube, like a single drawing, kind of like a necklace. And then I kind of just hit a little triangle in there to kind of blend in. So that could have been the same yellow as uh, as the, the skin, for instance, and you wouldn't really notice that there was, I mean, maybe you notice from certain angles, but generally you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, something else that I learned while I was kind of trying to get low enough for, for VR chat was um, having the arms like this was basically twice as heavy as the arms I ended up with here. So these arms are 
just single stroke. So just one tube. And to make those arms, I just go and I make a tube like this, and then I will kind of taper it at the end to kind of be a shape like this. And then, uh, because this character was going to be rigged, uh, I wanted to kind of give, I wanted to use the opacity tool to kind of reduce the geometry on it, but not kind of reduce the geometry in the center. So if you take the tool here, uh, the optimize tool, you can just brush over something like this, but you'll see that it automatically tries to favor the ends. It wants to keep the geometry kind of as is. So this is terrible if you want to try to rig it. You would never be able to bend those elbow. So you can kind of do it, you can't even really do it manually because if you just paint it at all, even at the top, it kind of goes along the whole stroke, which is not ideal. You, from the bottom it seems to work a bit better, but generally speaking, it doesn't work. So I'm gonna use Quill's ability to kind of try to retain shape to my advantage so I can get these these kind of arm seams. So to do this, I will take another color, I'll take like a green, let's say, and I'll just color this area, I'll reduce it, I'll just put a green gradient. And then, if I do this, you'll see it leaves geometry in the middle because it, it doesn't want to flatten that green out. Um, because the way that Quill does color is it puts at each vertice, kind of it says, okay, this vertice is green, this vertice is green, this vertice is red, this vertice is kind of in between. So if you have that information, Quill will try to save it. If, like I had before, where there is no information, it's all red, it can just get baked, and it looks fine uh, if you didn't have any other use for it. But if you wanted to leave it, um, that's just a, a nice little pro tip that you can reduce it without completely annihilating your uh, your seams and so now if I was to put this into a if I was to rig this I can still bend it see there's still the geometry I need but I, I don't have the stuff in between which is wasteful um, and this isn't really useful if you're doing a quill animation uh, if you're doing a quill animation I would still separate it like this because it's a lot easier to to kind of um, grab this versus grabbing this uh, and it, you could animate in quill with this, but my personal workflow, I prefer being able to grab the individual pieces. But if you want to give it a skeleton in another program or a game, this is the best way to do it. Um, there's not much else to show. I did the exact same thing for the legs. Uh, as you can see, I have kind of the top and bottom just with a, an area where I can put a skeletal bend. And Did you show the fall off for the colorized tool? Some people might not know that yep. you can make the colorized edge very sharp. Yep, I will show that. So if you have uh, your 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 shape and you want to colorize it, you can take whatever color you'd like. And if you're in the colorize tool, uh, by default, it's going to be like this. So if you draw, it kind of has a subtle gradient and you can kind of build up color. But if you hold the left trigger and then push forward, to kind of as if you were changing brush size, it will now create this circle within the circle. And now if you try to color it, it will basically give the full uh, intensity uh, everywhere. So if you wanted to more accurately create some, some variance when you, before you optimize, you could maybe do this. And then if I was to optimize it to the max, I would basically get, and now let me just recolor it to the original color. So now I get those those hard edge areas that are still separated. And I think this also works with, if I draw a stroke and I say, bulge it out in the middle with the thicken tool, and then I optimize this, it'll kind of try to keep that shape so it doesn't look different from a distance. And so yeah, you can kind of influence how the optimize tool works a little bit if you, um, if you kind of put information in different areas. So these characters, like this, if I was to optimize, like let's say midway and optimize all, you can see this character does get more optimized. He's probably not 120,000 anymore, but he's still got so much information that's really not necessary. Uh, whereas you can get a character like this, which is completely clean. Um, and if you wanted to optimize it a lot, you'll see, like sometimes things will change, like the eyes. So if that was a problem, either optimize it less or 
maybe at the very end you can go back and kind of re redo those those missing strokes that kind of got destroyed. Um, but this guy now is he's actually four point four thousand. He he basically got shaved off with six hundred. But the areas where I lost information, uh, I don't I don't want him to be this low. I want that information here. I want that information here. I want the eyes. So five thousand is perfect for this character. Um, I'm going to show a few other characters. So I created this set of characters the same way. So this is the original. We're pretty heavy, and I didn't know if I'd be able to get this guy low enough because he's got these wings, and he's got this tail, and he's got all these complicated things. So to reduce it, um, again, his head is just one big tube stroke. His body is a stroke. These legs are kind of uh, a couple simple strokes. And then for the wing... It's a similar technique where I kind of put color here so I didn't get optimized. Um, the fingers, I actually did the same thing with them. I kind of put a color here, here, and here so that the finger can have like a proper bend in it for like bones. Um, which actually looks really great in VR chat. Uh, he worked out really well. Um, I chose to make the hair, it used to be tubes. I remade the hair as kind of flat strokes and it, it generally looks pretty nice. Uh, and the beak was made just with a, hold on, just going to make a layer. The beak is just a tapered thing like this that I then kind of bent into the shape I needed, optimized it, and then once it's optimized, you actually can have some fun with the vertices because you can kind of move them around. So you can actually kind of sculpt a little bit at the end or kind of do some low poly modeling just by moving the vertices, which is hard to do when the when the model is this dense because you can do it, but you don't get that fine control, so you often get like, um, you know, kind of a bumpy, ugly mesh. But once it's so low, you can actually do pretty well. The only thing to keep in mind is that um, you can kind of bend them, but only in the direction of the original stroke. So I can't necessarily take... I mean, you, you can get away with quite a bit, but it's still, it's not, it's not, you can't grab this vertice specifically and pull that out. You're not modeling the vertices, you're kind of, anim you're modeling the, um, the ring almost, or the edge loops. So you can move the edge loops around, but you can't move, like, Imagine it as a curve, extruded curve, that's probably the yeah. easiest analogy. You know, you're yeah. modifying a curve for the surfaces. Yeah, so... If you were to take into another software and kind of look at the curves, um, you'd basically be pulling out a shape like this, and then it would basically be creating edge loops around it, which is kind of what you see here. And then if you move this line, if you move the line like this, it's moving the kind of this piece. So that's kind of how it's working, uh, which is why you can't grab like a single vertice and move it. So it's all coming, like Goro said, from a curve. Um, the same reason why you can't, take the color tool and color this vertice versus coloring this vertice. They both kind of, the whole loop would kind of get colored. Uh, oh, so one thing I did here as well, kind of the same thing I did with the belt, is to do his hat, I just colored the top of the head, mm. and then I kind of just put the, uh, like a, it's just a single stroke drawn in a circle like this that I kind of placed uh, over here and that gives the right impression that he has a hat on even though it's technically just his head um, this character is another one I didn't know if I'd be able to pull it off because she's pretty complicated with the kind of face detail but I ended up building it mostly out of flat brush so if you look here at the original this was kind of a 3d piece um, this might have been flat brush already uh, the face was like lathe, so lots of strokes, and there's flat brush, but it's kind of messy in this area. Uh, so this one, I basically just reconstructed it with lots of different flat brush pieces. And I kind of just arranged them so that they looked correct from from a distance. And yeah, it worked out really well. And all the detail here, flat brush. Sometimes I'll detail things like this. I'll use just the colorize tool, and I'll just... I'll, instead of adding more strokes, I'll add color just uh, kind of like like this. And that's that's usually light enough for 
for most for most uses. Can you dissect the head a little bit? Like, can you remove most of it? Like the yep. fill layer, like for example, the brown. Yep. Inside. So if when you get when you kind of mine down. You find that the head underneath all of this is again just a single stroke. It's just a just a ball. So it's just a ball that I layered. In this case, lots and lots of flat brush strokes, which made it much lighter. This one was flat brush strokes at all as well, but I had also had these kind of strokes like this, and the head itself was really dense because I had kind of colored some of the color onto the head before. So this time, in this final version. I just use the uh, the flat brush to fill in all those details. You don't need to necessarily have a lathe to get that kind of stuff. And the hair as well, it's all the same shape. It's a shape like this that I duplicated and redid a few times, and that gives me the information I needed to kind of make that head of hair. Um, who is next? It's Alice here. So this character I actually had to change from the original because Doing a plaid overcoat shirt just wouldn't really work in Quill because, or you can do it in Quill because I did it here, but doing it and keeping it under 5,000 polygons was basically not going to be possible, at least not in the way that I had been working. So um, just there's too much detail, too much texture, and keeping it in just a few strokes and having it work and have sleeves would have been too much. So you can see I simplified this character um, more than the others. I didn't keep them quite as true to the original. But I also wanted this character to have a prop, and that was a kind of a mandolin instrument. And the props in VR check count towards your total player vertice count. So the mandolin's about 1,000. So I was already working with a character that I, I could only bring down to 4,000 to get them both together into VR chat. So, uh, but generally, you can see here, same technique. I made the tail, uh, and then when it was low poly, I was able to more easily kind of manipulate the shapes and use the color tool to kind of separate the different oranges. Uh, other than that, it's basically the same as the other characters. The head was a bit more complex. I, I couldn't just recolor it because I needed these kind of hard edges, which can be pretty tricky in Quill. So I built that out of lots of, uh, again, lots of flat brush strokes. So you can see if I kind of delete these. I started off with just a cone that had kind of two colors, and then with the flat brush, I added in the detail to kind of um, fill in the, that information that I needed. So maybe a flat brush stroke like like this, and then maybe uh, I taper this. And with a few strokes, you can get the look that you're looking for um, a lot of the time. And because it's so low poly, you can see I'm actually working with the undo a bit. Uh, you can see I'm actually putting my strokes, but I'm keeping them along the the faces that were there from the kind of the cylinder. Uh, so yeah, this was a pretty complicated one to do, and. How did you separate the head so it can be rigged? Oh, here's the mandolin. Like, is, it, is it like um, broken up at the neck? The head is broken up at the neck. I think it probably would have been possible to build this character without breaking it up at the neck. I probably could have yeah. say, it might be too low probably to do now, but I may have been able to, kind of. Do this, and then if you kind of use the grab tool, you can kind of taper things, um, like just with without changing. So I could probably have done this, and then recolored, and that would be another way to kind of get to that shape. And this is kind of ugly, but I think with the right thicken and thin, there you go. I probably could have saved myself um, a stroke essentially. But when you're trying to get it low, every stroke matters, especially these 3D ones. Um, Here's the mandolin that went with the character, so I wanted to figure out how to do that. So I think this mandolin, yeah, it's entirely flat brush. There's not a single other brush used here. So um, I'll create like one face of the mandolin. I think I had an image, so I kind of trace the the image, so to speak, and then that left me with kind of the body for the mandolin. And then afterwards, I just kind of duplicated it, moved it, changed the color. For the back side, and then I had to take a single ribbon brush. I'll just I'll kind of do a quick example of how that works. I would just do a ribbon brush like this, and I would use the grab tool to kind of line it up, and this gets you a pretty nice, nice low poly prop like this without needing to go crazy with the um, with the strokes. And what's nice about this is that once you have that 
kind of edge, you can take some more colors and you can kind of you can actually give it really nice um, like edge colors like this. Oh, I'm on multiply. That's why it's being weird. Uh, but yeah, you could get a very nice detailed thing like this, and even once it's optimized, it's still gonna look still gonna look pretty great. So I have another thing in here. This is from Golden Record. This is just to show that because we had a lot of ants in our film, and this wasn't the main character, and this was a kind of a background ant. And for the background ants, they were completely flat. Um, because, or they're not completely flat. I actually kept the legs and the um, the arms thick because they kind of looked, they came towards you. They they didn't really look right if they were flat. But most of the characters uh, in the background were actually like this, and from a distance, they look pretty normal. Um, you might you might be able to tell that they're not three D, but at a glance, they they look fine. I have no clue. <laughs> Uh, these characters also, I'm not going to show it here because I don't have the file in this project, but I actually built a walk cycle with transform keys, and then I was able to just replace, with transform keys and groups, I could replace the heads so I have like a, uh, an ant with a higher head, an ant with a bigger butt, and whatever, and I could just then bake those sequences down to keyframes, um, but using the same walk cycle. So we could get variants that all has the same walk. Um, and they'd all be flat ants. And this walk cycle also work with some 3D ants. So if we needed to go from the front coming towards us, I would just put a, a head in that same group in 3D or a flat head facing forward, for instance, and it always looked pretty good. So that was a little secret tip we used and made almost entirely with the flat brush because if we if the ants are made of the flat brush, they're 2,000 uh, triangles, which means we can have hundreds of those ants. We can have so many in a scene because you can have up to over a, you can have over a million triangles. So with 2,000 triangle ants, you can get really far. I'm guessing in the um, conveyor belt factory scene, the background ants are made like this as well? Yep. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Uh, background ants. Yeah, I was in, wondering, in how did you get so many ants? In there? <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they, they become flat pretty fast. <laughs> nice. Um, so I'm going to show something else in the doc that you probably didn't know, and that's that all this text is also quill strokes. I, I really, I'm not going to say I enjoy it, but I, I don't enjoy the, um, the look of PNG text in quill. If, you wanna, if I typed out cylinder in Photoshop, brought in the PNG, if you look at it from an angle, kind of looks uh, ugly, like it doesn't hold up. This is very sharp because it's made of quill strokes. So if I go to the text group again, this looks fine, but from like here, you know, it starts to look ugly, especially further back. It kind of has aliasing. And if it's transparent, it's even worse. They get these edges. So I kind of use the same techniques I've been showing to do text. I'm not gonna do this whole thing, but um, I would do say the letter N, I would just kind of take the line tool. Why well, is it not working? Oh, I know why. I'm in the wrong group. Um, yeah, if I went here, I would do the end. So I'd probably do a line like this, do a line like this, and then I would actually kind of bring it around. And you can see I'm using orange, and that's so that I can see it clearer. Otherwise, it's it's pretty hard to um, to work on stuff like this. And then I would use the thin tool to uh, to make sure that it matches kind of the original font. So I would just kind of thin it, and then I get like kind of a perfect N. And then for other letters like the M, you can actually take the original letter you just made uh, sometimes, and you can then kind of copy that. And I would want to make sure that these tails are kind of moved with the grab tool, but. A lot of the credits and a lot of the special features in, say, Soda Island are done this way just because I can't stand the uh, this. And in fact, it's actually a lot lighter. So it's kind of crazy that, that these films are so nitty gritty that you need to do this. But if we were to use PNGs for the, t for the credits, it would take up a significant amount of the film. That would mean that we would have to cut out character animation. So if you build it out of quill strokes, it's going to be about a 100 times lighter, <laughs> which is... 
uh, which is crazy. But we really want to push. We really want to squeeze all the all the uh, all we can out of the quest when we make those films. So we uh, we use Quill text a lot of the time. Um, once I have an alphabet, it's pretty easy to kind of. I'll show it again here. Um, it's pretty easy to just kind of grab letters and um, kind of just re remake new words. Um, so I could go like like middle, and I could make sure that's level. But you kind of need to make sure that the kerning and stuff is right. So usually I'll bring in an image anyway as kind of reference for how the text should look. But you can pretty quickly make words once you have an alphabet built. Um, now I'm just going to show some props. So these are props that I didn't design. These are designed by an artist named Alex, or he goes by Zadig. And I'm just going to show how I would build some props like this so that they're not necessarily going to be the lowest poly. Then I'm not going to try to get them down to 5,000 or, or anything, but just to show how I would build it using kind of these techniques. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the hammer. And so I would kind of start with a cube. I might taper the, t the cube a bit because you can kind of see that this part is tapered at the end. Then I would take the grab tool, I would kind of try to get it into that general shape. And then I want it to be a little bit thicker, but if I use the thicken tool, it's going to get thicker in every direction. It's kind of going to make a weird balloon shape. So to keep it kind of square, I'm just going to duplicate it kind of sideways. So then I get a bit wider of a rectangle like this. Then I would take this kind of gray. I would maybe color here a little bit. You can see there's a bit of Z fighting because these layers are on top of each other. But because they're the same color, with the wireframe turned off, you can't tell. It doesn't really matter. Um, so then if I wanted to be really specific, I can see that it's kind of rounded on the top, but flat on the bottom. So I would probably try to um, create a stroke like this. Maybe like that would be a slightly more accurate shape, but that's getting pretty specific. Uh, another way you could build this if you wanted to, or maybe I could build it on top of this, would be to just kind of take those original colors and then you could use the, the flat brush to kind of detail it like this. So now I have the kind of the shadow side. And then maybe I want this top, there's kind of like a rounded shape. So to do that, I would create just a flat round. I'd put it uh, in place. And then you'll be like, oh, well, it's kind of ugly. I would just take the eraser and I would kind of hide the, hide the top. If you do things with the eraser, you have to be a little bit careful because although you can't see this, if you take the, the selection tool, you can still grab it sometimes. So just be a bit careful that it might, if you're trying to grab something above, like say you have something here, you might grab this piece by accident even though you don't touch it. Um, so then yeah, I'm just do a few more details. So I would use flat brush again. I use flat brush for all the detailing just because it's, uh, it's the lightest and usually anything more is overkill and it will make your scenes heavy for for no reason so this too i will just add like this to get that lighting shadow side here and that's pretty good and then this piece is just going to be i'm going to combine a few shapes here so this looks like a kind of a like a elongated cylinder so i'm going to make a single cylinder. I'm going to duplicate it over like this and then I'm just going to make a kind of a rectangle that let me try to get the size just right. Uh, close enough. Like this and then I'll, I'll maybe offset just to get a bit of color variant so I can see it. That's just a bit too much. Um, like this and then this piece I can slot in um, and it looks, looks pretty good. Uh, if anybody has any questions while I'm doing this, you can, just because it's going to be um, just constructing this hammer. But if not, it's fine too. 
So here, I'm just gonna, I see it's a bit thicker here, I'll use the thicken tool. Um, and then if I wanted to, this whole piece could probably be just one piece, not this gold area, but everything else. So if the hammer's like this, I could then extend it like this, and I could then bulge this area out, color it gold, color this area kind of purple. And then with just one stroke, I'm able to create this, uh, this shape. And even, it's not a super complicated shape, but I think a lot of people would probably build this with, with multiple different pieces when you don't really need to. Um, especially if this is a prop that a character is holding and they're, they're even, even up close, it, it holds up pretty well. Um, so a technique I sometimes will use for this sort of thing, there's a bunch of, there's so many ways we could build this. Uh, we could build it just with a, we could build it just with a stroke like, you could make kind of make a circle like this and you get a decent kind of shape. If you want one that's a little bit more low poly, you could basically do this. You could make one. And then what I sometimes like to do is kind of use the eraser tool on both halves and then just recombine them. And then you get a thinner kind of uh, cylinder than you normally would be able to get in quill. And then this shape I could, I mean this could be even thinner too if I wanted it to be. I could, let me just separate it again. Yeah, if I was, if I wanted a really thin cylinder I could erase even more. You could also use the Zeyu technique, right? The Zeyu technique works but sometimes it creates some weird geometry. Um, and I'm not... Uh, I I have that happen like a few times, but like for the game character now, for example, mm -hmm. for um, I relied on that because you can light it really nicely. I think I'm going to try the Zayu technique. From what I know, it's this, but you have to do it from very far away. Is that right? No, you just make the brush large. Make the brush super large so it's it's like encompassing the... No, no, that's, that's fine when you do the thicken, mm -hmm. the thicken brush size. Oh, just make this brush big. Super, and then just start thickening. Yeah, so that's another way you could get the same shape. Uh, and this is, I guess this is also a bit cleaner. It's not going to grab, the eraser version will sometimes grab things incorrectly. Um, the only real when, advantage when the other one this, has. Yeah, when you make this smaller now, uh, scale it down. No, undo and scale it down. And use the thicken tool again, and it's much faster. Yeah, and then you can get a much sharper edge that way. If you keep doing that, yeah. And then the good thing about this is you can color the sides and the top and the bottom separately. Let me try. If you go to the center, yeah. Yeah. And then if you want the top to be bright, you go from the center. Yeah. yeah so exactly. you, yeah, it's you get a nice little platform like that. Yeah, it's, that's a good technique. Uh, that works as well, and that gives you more control. It does, it, yeah, it does destroy. Um, sometimes it just does weird things, but it's in the knot it works. <laughs> I think we found that when we were making one of the Soda Island episodes, we were trying this, and I think those areas that we'd done this didn't work on Quest in some cases, but I don't know if that's changed. It's been a long time since we did that. Um, I'm not sure if Felix is still in the call, but he would know if we're still using this technique. I, I don't usually use this. He, he might. Yeah, I noticed that the we top do. face sometimes um, gets angled, you mm -hmm. know, so it looks kind of like broken, but um, yeah, so far... Most of the times it looked okay. I think it has something to do with precision as well, with bounding boxes and stuff like that, that this brush, this trick doesn't really like larger mm -hmm. bounding boxes. I don't know. But it's a, it's a really good way to do low poly models. Like for my Unit 7, I use this technique a lot. Mm. I actually have a, a little thing that I like to do personally. It's, it's me, Sneaky. Um, like I like to optimize it the moment you make the brush shape. And, and then you start working from that point so that the thickness generates from like lesser subdivisions and then you get like this really clean box out of it. Like it's the bevel basically kind of goes away, but you still get to color it a little bit. It's, it's, it's tougher though. It's a little tougher to work with like color wise, but it's still, it's still kind of, you know, it covers some bases with it. Yeah. Totally. And make that, that little um, flat piece you made you see that it's like a black 
black border, the one on the right. The oh, yes. Sword. It's because the geometry so is so it, dense. It, it, yeah, exactly. If that was optimized, you can... Can you optimize it maximum? Yep. Yeah, you get like the super clean shape that you can work with. Pretty nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a good this one. Also works for, this also works for um, the cube and stuff if you want to have a flat, flat, flat platform. Like, for example, the bottom of the hammer. If you want that to be with a cube brush, you could also do like a little cube stroke and do the same thing. Mm. Yeah, I can try that in a second, actually. So here I'm just going to use, just to get the, kind of, you see this lighting on the edge of this piece of gold or brass? I just, you can't get that with the with the current piece, so I'm just kind of adding a, a line brush so that I can do kind of what I did with the mandolin earlier. And I can just... Uh, take the highlight, kind of color it, take the gold, I'll just, you can kind of just add those kind of highlights to a piece like that, and it makes, it works really well for metal especially, but any edge that you had that you needed to kind of detail works, works super well. Um, and yeah, let me try the thing with the square brush. So, if I make my cube, and then make it huge. Uh, no, make it bigger, not not smaller. Yeah. So now I can then now that it's small, I can you make it bigger or smaller at this point? Bigger, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, well, the thing is, like, it's relative to the scale of the brush stroke. <laughs> so even if you make like um a very low res cube. Right, like a small one, then you get a stronger bevel, if that makes sense, because you start with a lower rest model. If you make a big brush stroke, you get like super sharp edges. So, let me just try this. The If I wanted to be a rectangular, I guess I would just do this, and it would basically exactly be fine for, for most cases. Yeah, I could. It's not going to fit because I wasn't... Oh, yeah, it's almost... It's pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could... But yeah, another method, right? Another yeah, method. it's another method to get shapes. Um, and the more ways you have to make shapes, the more things you can create here. So uh, I'm just going to show for something like this, if I wanted to give it that... I'm not going to give it a perfect gradient along the shape. I could if I was to, to build it a different way, but I'm just going to use... kind of. I'm going to just kind of cell shade it with a... Um, a ribbon brush this time just gonna kind of do this and then I could do the same for kind of the dark area I could just kind of do this and that's that's generally all you need just a little bit of detailing with the oops make sure you don't grab the wrong stuff bit of detailing with the um, ribbon brush usually goes a long way um, here I can see there's a bit more kind of a shape down here I'm just gonna add like a single stroke for that Maybe gonna gotta extend this. Uh, I believe that this is an area where I can probably remove this gradient if I just take that loop and just move it closer like this. Uh, and then I could also move the edge loops to kind of recreate that smoothness. But that gradient is now a lot less noticeable than it was before. Um, I would probably want to take this whole piece duplicate it down a little bit and then add a shadow across the whole thing with the multiply tool and that just looks nice it just gives it more depth without making it without going crazy you're only adding one more brush stroke to do that um, for this it's just going to be a sphere and then I'll, I'll do what I did before I'll just kind of do that a couple times Stick this on, and then can I erase the middle of this to get a ring? No, didn't think so. Uh, for a ring, I'm just gonna make a ring. <laughs> it's not gonna be anything too fancy. The best thing about Quill is that you can kind of fix your problems at the end with the grab tool. So you don't have to make a perfect circle on your first try. You can if you're really good. So that's good enough for me as a ring. So I would just kind of, uh, I would just kind of attach it like this, and yeah, that's that's how I would make a weapon like that. 
and you could continue to go in in detail if you wanted. So if I was to do that, I would take the kind of the do this, and maybe I want to have a like a little bevel kind of on the edge. So I just take a, a brush stroke like this and just kind of go like that, like this. Yeah, um, I don't know what time we're at. I could make more of these props if there's still. Oh, no.